for a minute or so. I know we have a bunch of folks coming in right at the moment here. So just take a moment to settle in. Go so ahead. glad to have you with us. So, I know we have a bunch of folks coming in right at the moment here. Muting my friend Francisco, who's hearing me on the live stream echo with a little bit of a delay. Um, yes, this is going to be recorded. Um, it'll be available on our YouTube channel, Pendle Hill USA, um, later this week if you want to return to it um, and share it with uh, anyone in your community or meeting um, that will be available later. All right. Well, welcome, welcome friends. I am going to get us started here. My name is Lena Blunt. As I've said, I'm the education coordinator at Pendle Hill. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight for our February 1st Monday lecture with Marsha and Mike Green. I'll introduce them in a moment, um, but want to get some logistics um, out of the way here in the beginning to orient you a little bit to um these sessions so you might notice that um we're going to ask most folks to stay muted uh through this session so that we can clearly hear uh, mike and marcia throughout there'll be some specific times where uh, you'll be invited to unmute those will be very clear um and uh we'll have one of those to get started um, but for the most part, uh, we're going to keep folks muted so that it's easy to, uh, to hear. Um, we have lots of folks on this call tonight, so uh, we do uh, try to keep things muted uh, just so it's not too cacophonous. Um, there will be a question and answer session at the end of tonight. Uh, the way we've chosen to do those in our first Monday lectures is um, we... Uh, close the chat so that you can only chat to me and Francisco and we will be sort of moderating the chat um, and reading questions aloud for Mike and Marcia to uh, respond to. So uh, if you think of questions throughout tonight, I encourage you to write them down. You can even send them to uh, Francisco or myself uh, during uh, the evening um, and we'll keep a hold of those and uh, share those out loud um, as we have time um, at the end of the evening. I wanna make a couple of announcements and invitations uh, for upcoming programs at Pendle Hill. Of course, uh, the first Monday lecture is a monthly series. Um, it's on the first Monday of every month. Um, our next first Monday lecture will be March 1st uh, from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and will be with Jesse White um, it will be an interactive program, returning to creative and spiritual playfulness. Returning to creative and spiritual playfulness. So if that intrigues you, invite you to join us again um, next month on the first Monday, which is March 1st. Also, um, Mike and Marsha will be joined with two other couple leaders, uh, Jeff and Kathy and Sal and Annie uh, to lead a couples enrichment retreat March 13th and 14th and 20th and 21st. Um, so if you hear things tonight that pique your interest, I encourage you to check out that program. Um, there are still um, spaces in that program of uh, couples enrichment retreat later in March. Without further ado, um, I'm excited to introduce Mike and Marsha Green. They have been leading retreats for families and couples since the early 1990s. Um, and uh, Mike has served as a core teacher with the School of the Spirit. Marsha served on the board of Friend Journal and the Carolina Friends School. Um, and while residents in Auckland, New Zealand, they traveled extensively in the ministry, married for 38 years, their member of Durham Friends Meeting. 
Mike and Marsha, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Lena. And um, let's um, settle in together. And as we do so, I'm going to invite Lena to unmute us so that we can soften this space together. And we'll just lead, our, um, lead us all in just three short breaths, each one just a little longer. And hopefully that will join us as best we can in this particular medium over Zoom. So Lena, when you're ready. <laughs> I think the way the settings currently are, we would have to invite everyone to unmute. Um, it'll be a slow process to manually unmute each person. So if you can unmute yourself, that would be welcome. So let's just close our eyes as we um, do all that unmuting. Let's just take our breath in and out. Again. Let's continue in waiting silence just for a few moments here. During this time, Lena or Francisco, you can mute everybody. So breath is one of those words that um, once it's lifted up to you, you start recognizing it everywhere. <laughs> and um, one of the passages that came to us as we were thinking of our breath was um, how it's essential to life. And that took us to um, the Gospel of John. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. So our intent tonight is to take a spiritual practice of listening that we, that you and I, um, have learned within the context of friends couple enrichment and to explore with you how and why we believe that we can use it to enrich our meetings, to make our meetings more abundant. We often refer to the discipline of listening we use as couple dialogue, but we're convinced that it's useful far beyond our relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, we've experienced that listening with discipline. It's a way to decenter ourselves and to center or, or value the relationship, the relationship with another person, with a group of people, with spirit. Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his life together um, says this rather pointedly, 
there is a kind of listening with half an ear that presumes already to know what the other person has to say. It is an impatient, inattentive listening that despises the brother and is only waiting for a chance to speak and thus get rid of the other person. This is no fulfillment of our obligation. And it is certain that here too, our attitude toward our brother only reflects, reflects our relationship to God. In this ministry of service, um, Bonhoeffer in my reading is connecting our wholehearted listening to another to our relationship to God. And we're going to suggest, we suggest this evening that um, there is an integrity that we're reaching for um, between our inner life, our life in our committed relationships, our life within our faith communities, our walk in the world. It's all of a piece. Each needs its attending to. Mm -hmm. So we would like to wonder with you tonight. We would like to wonder, how do we create communities where everyone can breathe and be gathered? How can we take Douglas Steer's words about listening one another into wholeness and translate that from between you and me mm -hmm. to between us and the meeting or the church? or any other group. So how do we realize more abundant life in our meeting and church communities? Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna share with you arises from our um, um, 38, 40 years of being friends, of being parts of communities, um, meetings in London, England, in Chicago, um, in Auckland, New Zealand, um, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and currently in the meeting here in Durham, North Carolina. And it also builds on our experience of taking and teaching parenting classes one of the things we learned there was to speak and name and claim our own emotions. And we practiced the art of speaking so our children could listen to us, uh, mostly by using that classic, I feel when, because statement, which ex helps explain the impact of things that are happening on me. So we had a big chuckle back in the mid nineties having not only taken um, the systematic train for effective parenting, where this I feel when because statement is central. central. Um, we walked into, and then we started teaching it. And then in the mid nineties, we took our first couple enrichment workshop at, at um, the Friends General Conference summer gathering. And we walked into the, the workshop room and where Vicky, Mickey and Vid Deming were going to lead the workshop, the couple of Richmond workshop. And they had written up on the board, I feel, feel when, when because. because, and we thought, okay, I think we know this. <laughs> <laughs> Except one of the things that they brought us into contact with was the use um, of this as a tool for listening. Yeah not just speaking, but listening. And so that's what we're focusing on tonight, how we take this listening to, to more than our children, more than our partners, how we can listen corporately. But we acknowledge that this is building on the work that David and Vera Mace um, Quakers started in 1969 with a Rufus Jones lecture um, entitled Marriage as Vocation. And that's actually what began what is now called Friends Couple Enrichment. And it's rather wonderful that the first training of leaders for Friends Couple Enrichment was held at Pendle Hill 52 years ago. 
So we are grateful that we are again part of a joint effort between FCE and Pendle Hill. Right. Yeah, that's part of the story. So we're also acknowledging that this evening um, we expect our message won't be perfect. Um, um, we trust that you all will listen beyond the limitations of the words that we share with you. Um, we're also acknowledging that as friends, we do have places where we actually exercise disciplined listening in the way that we're going to describe it this evening. And places that we practice this um, most clearly are in clearness committee meetings um, where there's a very clear focus person. Um, there's a clear committee that's lifting up questions for the benefit of the person, the focus person. Um, there's worship sharing where if we say any guidelines around worship sharing, it includes that speak from the heart, do not respond to another, no judging, no interrupting, for example. All those examples of there's a discipline. Um, we're putting guidelines around how we listen to one another. So what we're offering up this evening is how we might broaden that palette of how we listen to one another. And we're going to share um, through the evening um, learnings that we have been taking from our years of doing workshops and retreats with couples and applying them to our meeting community. Right. So we'll be telling some stories. Yeah. So when we say disciplined listening, what do we mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's give one example of what that discipline is. And we've already begun to introduce it. And that is there are specific roles when we listen intentionally to one another. So as in the clearness committee, there is the focus person or what we might call this evening, the speaker. Those on the committee are listeners, listeners. listening the focus person, the speaker into wholeness. And then, which is also central to couple enrichment, is the witness, the witnessing couples. Right. So we have these three roles. And one of the important disciplines that we practice in couple dialogue or discipline listening is staying in one of those roles for a long time, not jumping around, not being confused as to what role we're in. Um, and for the listener in particular, staying in the role and staying in using the skill of reflective listening, mm -hmm. um, reflecting back what they hear, not responding to it, but reflecting it um, until the speaker says, yeah, you've heard me. You understand. You understand. You, you get, get it. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in our practice, we trust that the witnesses are holding everyone in love, um, that they are, it's almost like centering prayer. They are just supporting those who are speaking and listening. So we've taught this practice to hundreds of couples around the country, as well as in New Zealand. We have some of our New Zealand friends with us this evening. And we've started using it outside of couples um, and it, within our Durham meeting. Mm -hmm. And so rather than just trying to talk about this discipline, we want to, to sh share with you a video clip that kind of shows it. Um, this video clip was recorded in um, a small group from meeting of which Mike and I are a part, um, but this small group is um, ex had agreed to experiment with this form of disciplined listening. Now it's a video clip, you'll only see two people. That's a factor that we recorded it on Zoom, um, but it was recorded in a group and this group was committed to, um, how should we say, working together with each other to 
kind of process what we've been learning in meeting about being an anti-racist faith community. Right. right. The first person you'll see is Anna, and she is actually speaking in response to a meditation that we had just done about how we were feeling about our relationship to the meeting. And then as you watch, you will see that Courtney becomes her listener. So we just want you to know that there is a small group here that was present to this video, um, but it wasn't a video at the time to this live stream. So in effect, we are now all going to be witnesses right. to this um, interaction, this speaker listener right. um, interaction. So we're going to ask Lena to share her screen and share this video and ask you all to be witnesses for about four and a half minutes. I, I wonder if there's um, like some permission that I'm trying to find for myself and some spaciousness around um, the mystery that exists there in that question. But I think mostly what I've been holding is like a feeling of wanting to get to answers and clarity and um, a feeling of responsibility around that process that I think has shut down um, maybe some of the spaciousness that can exist and just like sitting in the mystery and like being in that unknown. So I think what I'm hearing you describe is a tension between wanting answers and wanting clarity, but also realizing that we have to sort of sit in the mystery of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, I think I know intellectually, like I've learned <laughs> to know that um, mystery and discomfort that exists there is really generative um, and that the rush to be in, fix it and figure it all out um, can sometimes cut that short. So I think I'm realizing that I think I have a need to sit back and like, um, yeah, to like notice the, the longing, um, especially for a feeling of like corporate, corporate process and corporate group listening and like being in something together. Like that maybe is the feeling is like, oh, that's the longing of, um, being in connection and in relationship, having some clarity about where are we going together? How are we growing and healing together? How do we even listen into that <laughs> as a big group? Um, there's, yeah, there's longing for me and um, to have some process like that that I can't really imagine. Okay, so I'm hearing you describe longing for a process and I think I might have gotten a little lost there but yeah. long, longing to stay in the mystery but knowing that your inclination is to want to step in and fix things but that the mystery can be generative that stepping in may make us lose that mm. Yeah, and I think the longing is like a connectedness. Right, a longing for connectedness. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's most of it. I think I have a sense of being on my own journey and having these small circles and there being some journeying in small circles. Um, And the longing is for a sense of connection in our, in our collective body and a sense of being on a journey all together. So the last that I heard was 
we're on sort of an individual journey and we have um, small circles that we connect with, but there's a longing for the collective journey um, together. Yeah, you got it. I want to just take a moment and honor, yeah. honor that sharing. It's always such an honor, both when we witness, um, witness Anna and Courtney in this example, witness couples across so many workshops and retreats, just to feel this tenderness. And even in that longing that Anna was after to feel that sense of we're being gathered together, mm -hmm. the space is being softened. Mm -hmm. And it's done within the context of Courtney giving of herself to listen to Anna. Right. And even as witnesses, we're seeing our common humanity. Yeah. Just it pulls on that. Yeah. I also want to point out again, and, and it always, I love this, how the listeners decentering themselves and kind of putting aside their own agenda mm -hmm. um, allows the speaker to just keep going deeper. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's yeah. part of that discipline right. that, that right. flowers. Yeah. Yeah. We often talk about that as peeling the onion, yeah. the layers of the onion, yeah. and getting down to um, what, is, what is yearning to be said? Right. What is the soul yearning to reveal? Right. And um, I have to say for myself that my sense of gatheredness in the gathered meeting has most often occurred in these times when a couple is sharing and, and, being, listened and to. being listened into and us witness being a witness right yeah so as we've thought about um, this example and and other examples that we want to share with you today um, we recognize that there are learnings that we want to share the learnings that help us understand the power of the disciplined li listening in a small group or a meeting context. Um, and again, it goes back to that desire, desire for enrichment, for desire for abundance. Um, the, the more of abundant life yeah, that, yeah. yes. We have relationships yes. in our meeting and can we have more? We have, can we make them deeper? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we love the fact that this kind of disciplined listening um, creates a space and structure where that happens. And I think that there's a potential because what we share as a couple and what we share in our meeting community is a commitment to be present. Yeah. That there's a commitment to a common table. Mm -hmm. There's a commitment to being in communion and um, there's a longing for that. How do we get there? How do we get ourselves out of the way? Right. So we're gonna share our screen now as we work through um, six different, what we're calling learnings, um, so that you can follow along as we, as we talk about how we've translated them into some pretty recent meeting mm -hmm. uh, activities. So the first learning that we want to share um, is that boundaries create safety and they also encourage exploration. Um, when there are We've just experienced a speaker, a listener, you've been witnesses. Those are bounded roles and they provide 
in part the safety, the, the bumpers <laughs> into which we can then safely reveal. We, J just as we said in worship sharing, for example. Right. right. We know what to expect. Um, and that, that's part of that safety. I know what to expect from the listener. I know what to expect from the speaker. I know what to expect from the witness. And I trust that they will abide by those boundaries. And I think the part that I really honor in this is the courage that it takes. Um, and in a sense, you know, the opposite of the courage, the sacrifice, you know, the listener sacrifices their own opinions and words. They put it on a shelf for the time that they are listening. Mm -hmm. The speaker in entering in this has to be really courageous because they don't know when they enter what the soul might reveal. Right. Um, in fact, oftentimes um, we don't know where a this, this di dialogue is going to go. Right. And then the witness is just to hold. Um, and that you mentioned centering prayer, you know, coming back to the word, you know, because I know that as a witness, my mind strays, oh, why don't they do this? <laughs> Oh, I have the solution for them. But then coming back to the holding, right? That um, that sense of, okay, I've strayed. All right, no judging. Just come back, come right. back to holding. Right. Um, hold on while I get my screen to go down one. Uh, slide two. I just wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. slight, slight technical problems here. There we go. Okay. So a second learning. <laughs> <laughs> Embrace <laughs> imperfection and incompleteness. I always tell Mike this is my favorite one. <laughs> because... I am imperfect, and I often am incomplete in what I try to say. Um, well, incomplete is just saying you don't know what the end is right. or where where the journey is going to take right. you. Yeah. So. But we saw a, an example of this with Courtney and and, mm -hmm. and um, Anna mm -hmm. in that. Well, for starters, one time Courtney said, "I don't think I heard that. Did did I get that?" Um, so she was uh -huh. kind of saying, "I'm not perfect." Right. Tell me if I've got it right, right or wrong. Right, right. Um, but also what we talked about before, the incompleteness in a way of um, Courtney's reflection allowed Anna space to mm -hmm. go deeper and to reveal more. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And su such a, a wonderful opportunity. So why don't you tell your most Actually, recent I, story? Actually, I want to say one other thing before I oh, tell okay. the story because okay. um, one of the lovely things that I probably should have said this in learning one, um, having boundaries means that we can call each other back to them. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Where's my fish? We have a boundary. When we dialogue, we use a fish. And so if I have the, the fish, I know I'm the speaker. And if you start giving me advice, I can say, Mike, I have the fish. Right. Can you please reflect what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. And when I'm finished, mm -hmm. I can say, All right now I'll be your listener. Right. So that was harking back to number one. Um, but in reference to um, incompleteness and imperfection, I want to share a little bit of a story um, that happened within the last few months here at Durham Friends Meeting. Um, I was clerking a small committee that was discerning how to respond to um, an application for a grant from the meeting. The group had read all of the application material, so the facts were all laid out. And I might have in the past simply said, so what do we think? But I was led to do something different. I was led to try something to deepen our community. And so first I gave some boundaries. I said, I would like to permission to divide our discussion into two segments. Um, the first segment is why do we want to say yes to this? The second segment was, what are our hesitations about saying yes to this? So that was some boundary setting. 
But then before we started answering those questions, I also asked permission as the clerk to reflect what I was hearing. I did it partly so I could write up a report for people who weren't with us, but I also wanted to give that spacious sense of listening. Mm -hmm. um, so an example of what happened was um, one person had voiced a worry um, that the giving of the grant might result in um, somebody coming back repeatedly to the meeting for more and more grants. And a second person uh, voiced a, a discomfort with that. And so I reflected it back, the discomfort back. And the person began to share their sense that this fear of dependence had been used a lot to argue against giving help to people who needed it. And so I reflected that back and they said, yeah, I really wanna be big hearted. And the lovely thing was that that then caused another person to say, oh, I had some other thoughts, but now, yeah, I wanna be big hearted too. So it allowed not just the speaker, but others who were listening to change a viewpoint. Right. So you are helping them listen more deeply into the deeper and deeper layers of their knowing right. and their deepest wish. And not accepting that the first thing they said was the complete right. Right. answer. Right, right. So the third learning is already up on your screen um, or our screen. <laughs> um, reach first for understanding. Um, this is so important. And um, if Marcia likes the second one, embracing imperfection, I like this one. <laughs> um, because even before we get to, um, you know, problem solving, um, to trying to figure out how we're going to move forward, um, part of what this slowing down of this process allows, part of what the unpeeling, the unpeeling? The, the peeling, peeling the, the onion. The peeling of the onion allows, um, is getting to a deeper understanding of who we are, um, each at this common table in this relationship. And so I have sort of a parallel story to Marsh's, and this too was from a committee I was clerking this um, past summer. Um, we were actually charged with um, coming back with, if we can, could, with recommendations for actually setting up this fund. Um, for people in financial need. And um, what I was moved to do before we actually began meeting was to ask myself, and the question really arose out of doing this racial um, equity mm -hmm. training. Um, so here I am clerking yet another committee. How am I called to do this differently? How am I called to um, be transparent? how am I called to lay out a process by which um, we can listen together? And so I actually asked permission of the committee to experiment. And we experimented with a process that looked something like this. And we're going to um, put this up on the screen. So this is showing um, a process in two halves, if you will. Um, the first half is on the left side of the screen and the second half is on the right side of the screen. While it may seem linear, um, we can actually feed back at various points in this process. And what was so important in terms of my understanding of getting to understanding first before moving into that second part of the journey the right hand of the spring was to understand how do we come to a collective table? How do we come to the common table? How do we soften this space so that um, we're not putting our opinions first in, but what we're doing is sharing such that we come to know one another and 
we come to know what our shared values are in engaging in this particular issue. And so on that left-hand side, you see the word discovery and beneath that, decentering ourselves by sharing for the collective table. And so Marsha shared with you sort of the changing the question. It's not friends, what do we think about this? Or what do you think about this? It's taking that question and saying, what is a value here? Or what is a story that I'm bringing to this particular issue that I can divulge, that I can disclose for the benefit of our common knowing? And part of that was, what do I need to admit to? Right. Um, what biases do I right. have? Um, what skills do I have? Right. Um, we had right. people with particular skills uh, on that committee mm -hmm. that if I hadn't known about them, right. uh, I wouldn't have known about them. <laughs> so I was thinking of that question sort of, um, okay, friends, what do we think? And I, I thought, that's a lazy question. Hmm. It, it's more about what, what are you bringing in terms of your gifts, your skills, your stories, your narrative experiences, and your biases to this table. So this is all about disclosure. It softens the space. We know one another. And then we could explore through this dialogue, this reflective listening, um, the values that were at play here that we wanted to lift up for ourselves, again, for our collective table. And what were the actual questions before us that we needed to um, lift up, get more information on, or for the sake of the collective table? So this was getting to our collective understanding. And when we actually got there, and moved into the second half of the journey in terms of actually discerning what was God's will for us, um, it actually emerged organically from all that pre-work. Right. So often we seem to jump into wanting to solve things. And in fact, I remember yeah. that as we were doing the exploration of our values, mm -hmm. we'd men mention a value and one of us would start saying, well, and if we did this, it would meet that. <laughs> that value and we'd be going wait we're still just lifting up the values we're not going into problem solving yet so, so again we had that process and we called each other back into right. the process when we strayed when we were urgently wanting to get to solving it right um yeah those and, and those in, are lovely examples and, and and we were able to reflect back uh the values in particular in a way that said you've named this value, I've named this value, we can see where they compete, mm -hmm. but we aren't competing. That's right, we've had decentered ourselves. We've decentered ourselves. So we've put these values out right. on the table right. for all of us to- and, and you know what else happened was that because we ha had the safety of this process that we could call back ourselves back into, we were having fun. Oh yeah. We were playing. Yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed the lightness of that experience. Right. Um, and um, I'm so appreciative of doing that experiment. Right. And, and the willingness of people to do it with us. Yep. Yeah. 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 So I think we want to move on to the next. And we're going to share the fourth and fifth um, ones together, I believe, if we can figure out how to do that. Oh, take, uh, I need to stop annotation. We need to stop annotation, right. Okay. And no, no, let me, okay. So, Four and five we put up together because they are interwoven with each other, but we, we really do believe that disciplined listening is a learned, it's a learned skill. It's a spiritual muscle that can be trained and can be strengthened. And, and what we teach is not dissimilar to a whole other range of different 
listening techniques that go by different names, right. nonviolent communication being one of the big ones. Right. Um, it's what you would use in um, mediation. Right. Um, and so this is nothing new. It's the question different, is, different color. why don't we actually learn it right, right. as a community? <laughs> and so often um, in, in our couples work, we've, uh, we've heard people say, oh, I did that once 15 years ago. Right, I, I got right, it. Right. And we're saying, well, it's sort of like, do you go to yoga class and say, I went to yoga 10 years ago and I got right, it. Right. Um, it. It doesn't work for me like that. Right. Um, particularly because this kind of listening can feel very odd at first, um, particularly the reflective listening um, and decentering myself. Uh, it, that can be a struggle for me, but the more I practice, the more I see the benefits that it brings, right, right. the more willing I am to practice it right. more. So you got to start that cycle. The virtuous cycle. The vir virtuous yes. cycle, yeah. yeah. And I think the other thing that we've definitely learned is you don't wait until we're we're having an argument or right. that we're in conflict. Right. We practice this in the easy times right. so that we are, we have that muscle strengthened for the times when we, when there is a rub, right. when there is some friction. So <clears throat> between us as a couple, an easy time might be sharing a gratitude. Right. Um, it's pretty hard not to listen well to a gratitude. Right, right. right. But in, in a meeting situation, I can imagine um, listening to somebody share about their joy of seeing a new grandchild right. and just reflecting that back to them right. and letting them sink deeper and getting to know the, them mm -hmm. a bit better mm -hmm. by really dis having that discipline of listening. Right. And then we're going to move on to the sixth learning that we want to share with you. And there is always more. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've been married, what, for 38 years. Um, and there's always more for me to learn about you. Um, and at the same time, we are changing. We are aging. We are changing. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly, there's more to learn. <laughs> <laughs> so coming into this disciplined listening with a sense of curiosity. What am I going to learn today? Wow. What is God, should, God going to show me today? Um, things that I didn't know. What is going to lead me into that greater sense of connection, that abundant life? Um, and I would say that there's a hard message here because I think our ability to self-examine or examine ourselves either as a couple or particularly as a meeting is often seen as we're not doing it good enough. Right, it's, it's a hard, we think people are self-examining and being critical of us and we don't right. like it when people are critical of us. But if we translate that into, oh, <laughs> <laughs> there's more. Yeah. Um, that's what the discipline listening allows us to step into. Right. Yeah. 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 So we want to translate some of these learnings into what we're just going to call imaginings. And we want to imagine with you. We want to imagine with you what a meeting or a committee or whatever group of people that you feel committed to and connected to, um, we want to imagine what that might be. Um, what would it be like to be in a meeting or a church, for example, that teaches this fundamental peacemaking skill, this skill of disciplined listening? and to teach it to our children, to teach it to our adults, um, as we bring in new members, particularly when we think about our committee clerks and clerks of meeting. Um, so often we talk about or are satisfied with sort of the 
osmosis of learning. You learn Quaker business by process, um, by osmosis. We think we can go a lot deeper and to be in more abundant life if we were to actually Teach. be taught this disciplined listening within the community. And imagine a meeting or a committee or a group that regularly practices disciplined listening. Uh, a Quaker community or other community that not only equips us to use the discipline of listening for the sake of our gatheredness, but invites us and gives us signposts to say, let's do it now. Let's, oh, let's try this now. Let's imagine a meeting, a small group that seeks understanding at a collective table. It doesn't get stuck first in jumping into opinions first. What do you think? What does this next person think? What does this next person think? But what are we discovering that we need to know for our gathered sense of people? How do we get ourselves out, out of, of the, the way? way? How do we decenter ourselves to get to this collective table? My experience is we spend so little time doing that um, when being clear of how God is going to be asking us to respond and to move forward requires this tender work with one another. Imagine being in a meeting where the meeting kind of expects that, that we will reveal ourselves to each other, where we will listen to one another for more than just a moment for the collective good of everyone. We'll be imperfect and say, can you tell me more? Mm -hmm. Did I get it? Imagine the joy that we might find when we change that pattern of ignoring or not listening to people who are oppressed and marginalized and actually use our listening to, to, to hear, to reflect and to amplify mm -hmm. what they're saying. And another piece about this is, I don't think it has to be everybody. If we take as the bottom line is that we're softening the space in order to get to the collective table together. Maybe we only need to listen to three or four people in depth because we're not listening to them. We're, we're listening beyond them into what God has given them to reveal as their souls for the benefit of all of us. Yes, we believe that God can speak through anyone that doesn't necessarily mean that he divides the truth evenly between all of the people in the room. Well, we do have, yes, that understanding. <laughs> it's just how do we carry it out? Yes, that measure, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so imagine then having this learned this practice of disciplined listening in our communities as sort of our normative way of being with one another. And then the tender emotions arise. The passionate the, emotions. The, the passionate emotions, um, the defensive ones. We can, we have the tools not just to go back into worship, but also let's go into this reflection this curiosity. This curiosity. What is there for us to learn from what is being lifted up through this tender emotion? So we can use that listening to, to bring out that curiosity yeah. and learn from each other. Right, right. Because this is about, it's not about conflict resolution. This is about enrichment. This is about enriching ourselves as a community. Yeah.
imagine being in a meeting that knows and radiates the joy of abundant life where, where members singly and together take this, this way of listening, this curiosity, this eagerness to be at the communal table together and takes that radiantly out into the world. Right, and we have our own examples where that has been recognized, that the piece of understanding that we have found between us is a part of what radiates, and that has been reflected back to us. Um, I would love to know that I'm also part of a community that has known that abundance. Um, and it's not that we don't get there at times. <laughs> we have uh, life. But we, we do have life, life abundantly. But we want life abundantly. Yes. yes. We want the more that is our birthright. Yeah. It's the gift that we've been given. Yeah. I will stop sharing my screen here. So friends, thank you for receiving that this evening. Um, we are now going to enter into, um, I think, a time of worship together and um, an invitation for you through the chat to lift up your questions. And so, Lena will help moderate this right. part of the evening. So we're going to suggest that you take three or four minutes here mm -hmm. as we, we sit in silence and, and ask yourself what, what's rising in you as you listen to the imaginings of meeting life in, infused with this kind of disciplined listening and um, share perhaps share some of that and share your questions. If you can put them in the chat box, then uh, Lena will be the, the MC of this part. So again, we'll, we'll ask you to take three or four minutes here just to center in, um, listen to yourself and share any questions or comments uh, through the chat box.
There are a number of questions um, that have arisen. Prior to a discussion, do you stop and set the boundaries? What if the discussion goes astray of the boundaries? I think that's where we have found that um, getting everybody's agreement to a process like this ahead of time allows us then to gently and usually um, using humor or gentle love just to say, can we come back into our process? Mm -hmm. So it's not so much a judgmental, we've done it wrong, but simply calling people back in. We often talk about rewinding. Can we just rewind a minute and go back to our process? So what you're saying is there's, as in center and prayer, just coming back into mm -hmm. the practice, but also as we said in both our examples, seeking permission of those present to actually step into this process and actually saying what it is right. and what the guidelines are. And that was an, um, for transparency, right. not just leaning on Quaker process. Not assuming everybody knows what the process assuming. is. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question about thoughts about how this teaching uh, might need to be modified, if at all, in the Zoom era, mm -hmm. um, or, or could be applied uh, on Zoom? Well, um, in fact, both examples that we pulled from, um, all of the examples that we were, pulled from, were all, for, all in Zoom. <laughs> They've all um, happened within the last nine months. Um, I mean, yes, it helped greatly, I think, that we knew one another in pre-pandemic times. Yes. So we had been together. Um, so perhaps that was a help. Um, but it didn't alter the fact that we sought permission. And in fact, in some ways, this Zoom in having these windows that we're looking into um, are sort of boundaries in of them, <laughs> themselves that reflect, oh, I actually need to be more disciplined in listening to you um, as speaker than perhaps I might be in a room where it's much easier just to talk over or be right. in conversation it, with. Zoom actually requires us to have one speaker or cacophony. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, but yeah, so we've experienced it well in Zoom. And in fact, the couple enrichment workshop that we do at Pendle Hill will be a Zoom workshop. Right, yeah, yeah. as the one. As were the last two that we've done. Yeah, yeah. There are a couple questions about apply, if you have applied this learning outside of a Quaker context. Um, there's a specific question about if you've seen this applied um, in nonprofits or in the business world or um, yeah, just any experience you have applying it outside of a Quaker context. The workplace. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will say um well we, I mean the point that I would like to make about that is actually yes um to the extent that it's actually in some ways more courageous to do this sort of speaking because there may not be that common understanding it's it's harder to possibly to get everybody's understanding and buy-in at the beginning of a, a, right. a corporate meeting, for example. But I mean, boards that you have been on have included non-friends as well as yes. some friends. Yes. And so there's had to be an education. Right. But it, 
in a sense, it's an education for all, right. because even friends are not um, perfect, adept, <laughs> or have learned necessarily. Yeah. And I do recall a, an a time I had when I was clerking the school board um, where we set up the expectation of doing some worship sharing, but then I asked for each person who wants to speak in the worship sharing, can they try and reflect what they've heard before so that we got some of this reflective listening? And it worked for about half a dozen people and then it kind of broke down. And at that time, I was not courageous enough in that moment to call us back to uh -huh. the, the process. And I regret that. I think if that happened again now, um, mm -hmm. I would have stopped and said, friends, let's remind ourselves of what the process is. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just enjoying the image that I have of our daughter using this in her um jury duty no in her chairing oh, chair. of the arts commission yes. in alexandria <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and hearing the frustrations behind the yeah. uh, scenes yes yeah. <laughs> there's a couple of questions related to this um, idea of the messy processes where there's not buy-in from everyone mm -hmm. and what um perhaps what limitations or what strengths you found in still personally committing to this type of practice when you're in a mixed space and not everyone um, is, is doing the practice. For me, the, the discipline and the joy when I can do it is it really is in that saying, I am not the most important person in this room. And so I can be of service by being the listener even if there hasn't been this description of a process. So I don't have to ask necessarily permission to say to somebody, can I reflect what you're saying? I can simply do it mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and then continue to reflect back and say, am I understanding this correctly? Right. Am I understanding what you're saying? And the discipline for me is to stay in that listener role and not pop out and suddenly say, well, my opinion is. And I find that it does soften the, the atmosphere un, um, unconsciously, I guess maybe that's the word. And in that example, what you've already done is essentially in setting up yourself and owning that piece as listener, you're giving space for the speaker and everybody else automatically becomes a witness. Yeah. And it becomes an opportunity when um, at the end of a time, for example, to then reflect as a group, how was the process? Right. Um, how was the state of the room, the condition of the room at various times? Right. So that people will then begin to voice um, the actual process that you used. Right. So there can be direct learning and there can be indirect, indirect. learning. Yeah. Um, there's sort of a specific question here in some of your learnings from experimenting with this in your meeting. Um, if you would be willing to share um, from your experience in bringing this tool to your meeting have you found there are particular topics that where it's not helpful um, or topics where it's more helpful? <laughs> Part of my response to that, I don't think we have brought it enough times right. to be able to know that if there's that distinction. Um, what I do know is that we're at a transition time as a meeting where we are intentionally sitting with the discomfort of naming our white supremacy in our meeting and what that means for us. And what we haven't quite gotten to yet is how we're going to examine ourselves um, out of that learning and that reflection. Um, it seems a very opportune time mm -hmm. 
to actually engage in disciplined learning, listening, um, in order to move through this next part of our meeting life, even as a lot of meeting life is going on anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. would be so. I think that's a good answer. Um, we. I mean, the parallel would be that in our couples work, this applies to everything. Yeah, uh, yeah we, 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 we don't distinguish. And, and we, uh, um, we were present um, not, not very recently. This is actually uh, an in-person meeting we were at where we did have somebody who had some really strong emotions about an issue. And um, this was with, uh, this yes, was with the mm -hmm. couple, it was with the couple enrichment leader group. And so we knew a pro this process but we were actually able to use it in a business meeting where somebody needed to be listened to and actually requested that the clerk ask for some listeners so that the first person could speak and hear the words reflected back. And it only took about five or 10 minutes. But the big piece about that was the self-recognition. I am not gathered with you. I yes. cannot gather with you because I'm holding these tender emotions right. and I need to release them. Right. And this is a practice where I can release them and then feel part right. back into the body right. so that we can move forward together. And, and in that case, yeah. one of, there were, um, as usual, a mix of emotions, but one of them was a sense of resentment. And mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. was needing to be released so that we could all sit together at the communal table. Um, that's actually a great segue um, because one person asked about how you see this practice as related or distinct from the practice of clerking. Do you see a clerk as a listener for the meeting or do you see it as a distinct skill? <laughs> yes and yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it could be that the clerk may be at a point of not being sufficiently skilled or just not feeling um, that they can help facilitate such a process and may ask the members in the group who do feel that way to be the listener um, or to have a couple of listeners. I mean, this is where we can see our way forward in being quite flexible. We can stay in the group, large group, and have be witnesses to reflective listening happen. Um, or we could actually break out into smaller groups right. and see it happening in that. Um, but, you know, in our vision, in our ideal, in our imagining, um, we would love to be able to think that actually not just clerks, but many of us, that there would be a threshold, um, a number of us in the group where we would actually have these skills right. um, and have practiced them and so, could apply them. Yeah. So yes to the clerk is a listener, definitely. Um, but I don't think, just as I don't think that the clerk is the only person who can ever name the sense of a meeting, um, that other members in the group um, can also test a sense of the meeting. Members in a business meeting, I would think anyone could say, can I take a moment to reflect back what I think I heard you just say? And, there, and, and doing that step into this skill. And in fact, that happened at our meetings, business meeting the other night. Yeah. There was a moment when somebody did reflect back. Yeah. And it softened the space, I think, just in doing that once. And it wasn't the clerk. Right. Yeah. Marsha, there were a couple of reactions to what you described on the school board and some questions around this idea of suppressing your opinion to listen to the group. Um, I don't know if you would agree with that um, depiction, but... Um, the question I'm trying to create from some of these together is um, 
when you make a choice to be a listener, what support do you seek or what discernment do you have around then speaking? Is it you've released your need to speak? Is it you hold it for another time? You know you have an outlet for it somewhere else or um, curious to hear more for you um, when you make that choice to be a listener. Um, what that dynamic is then for you and your voice. It is, it's based on a hope and a trust that if I listen to others, I will eventually be given a time to speak my truth, or I will eventually be able to say to the person I'm listening to, have I heard you well enough that you are now willing to listen to me? Mm -hmm. And so deliberately naming the switching of roles. In couple enrichment, we really encourage this, that there's a lot of switching of the speaker and the listener. And that's why we have our fish that we pass back and forth. Um, when we're doing it with people who are not um, as familiar with the process, we have to signpost it more. We have to say, and sometimes we can say, let's, I'll listen to you for 15 minutes. And then I, I may need to step back and would you be willing to listen to me for 15 minutes? So there are ways to do that, but it does take, for me, a f it takes assuming the good intentions of mm -hmm. the person mm -hmm. to whom I am listening, that they will not soak up the rest of my future, <laughs> that I will be given time to share my peace. Do you think there's also the possibility that as their truth <laughs> is unveiled, it becomes a common truth and such that you may not actually need to speak? Right. Is that a possibility? That is definitely a possibility. Yeah. There are some questions about when the listening becomes difficult and if or how that relates to this is a spiritual practice. Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> it does get difficult. It can get difficult. Well, it can get difficult because um, there may be things and that we'll just use our own examples, I think. Um, when I might get flooded with emotion and um, it becomes very hard to listen in that particular circumstance. And so we have to signpost that um, I can't continue this right now, but I will return. Could we come back to this in 10 minutes or can we come back to it tomorrow? But again, the sense that we're committed to returning to the table yeah. is a very important piece of signposting. Um, so that I don't just leave. And leave me bereft. And leave you not knowing yeah. um, what's going on and what the next step might be. Right. Um, so learning the signposting is another part of the discipline that we haven't really lifted up very much this evening, um, but it's also important part of right. the practice. And, and another thing that again, we have come to use, and I have seen this used actually um, in the workplace, is when somebody shares something that strikes me as difficult to hear, yeah. um, like you're criticizing me or you're blaming me for something, mm -hmm. to have the courage to say, this is really hard for me to hear. Mm -hmm. I need to go away and think, I'd like to have this conversation again later. Right. So that's the practice. The spiritual part of that practice is the commitment to it, to coming back again. So there's a learning here about being, the signposting is about signposting the, where we are in the process when the content can become overwhelming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, we probably have time for about two more questions, um, and I'm not going to be able to ask every single question that have been submitted. Uh, folks are really um, engaging with this. Thank you. Um, but there's a question here about witnesses and the folks who are observing the sharer and the listener. And if you have learned times when those witness roles are particularly helpful or times when they're distracting. <laughs> um, so here are a couple learnings about the witness um, that I'll just say. Um, the first is that um, when two people, and I won't say necessarily a committed couple, um, but when others are witnessing what is going on, for those people engaged in the listening and speaking, the witnesses dissolve <laughs> um, into the background because there is an intensity of connection between the people who are listening and those who are listening, maybe not just one person, but maybe a couple of people as, and for the speaker. So that's one thing. The other learning, at least, which has been very important for me personally is to understand, and we often get this when we're asked the question, so how do you do this outside of like a workshop? <laughs> how do you or, do it at home? How do you do it at home? And there's a recognition for me that there are always witnesses. They may not be physical witnesses, but there is this communion that we're a part of, um, of people that have gone before us, of those that are coming after. Um, people I'm, who are praying for us. Are pre praying for us. Um, you know, there was that moment in one of our workshops when a young couple who had young children at home so the light bulb went on. Oh, we could do this with our children. And it was such a beautiful moment when we realized that um, this was healing across generations. And so those past generations are with us as witnesses, sort of wanting this to happen. Right. Um, and it's such a blessed place to be in, right. to recognize that the witnesses are not just physical today witnesses. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. I was trying to figure out how to weave these questions in earlier because there's been a couple um, on this tone and I just wasn't able to, but I, I feel a little sad ending with this particular flavor of question, but the, when you have a difficult person who won't hold space to listen uh, to you or reflect back uh, your feeling um, or, or is resistant to looking at others' realities, um, mm -hmm. how do you use this tool or discern how to engage that? Hmm. So one response is, um, and here I'm just, I know the sort of biblical setting is not for everybody. Um, but I'm going back to Matthew 18 when um, when this form of listening cannot be held to and somebody can't do it, then inviting actual physical, the elders, um, it's, it's part of our, an expectation in terms of our being in community with one another. Um, it doesn't, I accept that it doesn't answer the question because there are always people that will be difficult in this way. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the hardest times are when it's those people are wanting to part of the part of the community but cannot 
cannot reveal themselves. They cannot reveal themselves within yeah. the community yeah. to do this sort of listening. Yeah. And I think that it is, it is in many ways, um, I can feel more strength in me to listen to a difficult person. Um, and I do get frustrated when they will not listen back to me. And then I have to find other people who will listen to me and broaden that, that circle. So there is a place of, and this is using the word witness in a different context. There is a place for when either listening to a difficult person or um, when they, they can't do the, the other part of that, of simply being willing to be a witness to the process right. and to play your part and say, I've done what I can. And then and the rest is up to God. And the rest is up to God. There is a, yeah, yeah, we can't fix everything. <laughs> we aren't in control. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. Um, do you have any closing thoughts for us as we approach the end of our time? I, I think for, for me, my, um, I want to hold on to, it's, it's part of my faith, this promise of abundant life. And um, over so many years hearing in our meeting, various meeting communities, the desire for more small groups. <laughs> um, that is to me, um, saying in different words, there's a longing to be known. Um, when I hear the words of Anna in that little video clip of that longing, she has said it much more explicitly. There is so much, so many times when I hear various words and can translate them, this is what the soul is wanting to, is wanting, is these places where it's safe to reveal. And we did some work around the Friends of Color epistle from pre-gathering last year and just in the last couple of weeks. And whether when I can see, hear the words, I can't breathe, I hear this longing um, for a space where it's safe enough to be known, to be revealed. And I think this disciplined listening at least is one way to get to and to offer that space. And I hold in my heart the, the joy of knowing that I have been gathered with friends. I have experienced sitting at the communal table and feeling that sense of gatheredness, that sense that we are not here as individuals, but we are here as a community. And I hold to, to that picture and want to get there again and again and again. I know it's possible and I long for that to be even more possible and more accessible to all of us. Well, thank you so, so much. It's the end of our time. Thank you for being with us. And one thank final you. reminder for folks, if you're interested in joining the Couples Enrichment Program, with Mike and Marcia, Jeff and Kathy, and Sal and Annie. That's March 13th to 14th and 20th to 21st. There's more information on the Pendle Hill website. Thank you for listening to us. Yes, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Good night, friends. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Mike and Marcia. Thank you, Thank Lee, you. Francisco. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. It's lovely. It's lovely. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Very wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.